I was 16 years old, and I was traveling with my father and my brother, and my brother had his little boy, three years old, and we were traveling to go to Scotland. I was just 12, and we were going up the gangplank. Dad said to me, bend your knees, because I was very tall, and then you look smaller, and you look younger. So I got through a half price. All I could see was a great big monster ship. It looked a monster. Well, it was a monster. Well, I was four years old then. I was ending my eighth year when I boarded the Lusitania. My father had deserted us. And my mother decided that perhaps it would be better if she went back to her parents in England. And that's why she sailed on the Lusitania with six children. I don't think she even knew that it was in danger. Did you know that it was filled with contraband? There's been some cover-up about that Lusitania. It was really murder, really. She left New York on May 1st, 1915, bound for Liverpool, one of the biggest and fastest ocean liners in the world. She carried 1,265 passengers, and a crew of 694. But she was also rumored to be carrying something else, something for the British in their war against Germany. On May 7th, she reached the southern coast of Ireland. A little after lunchtime, in sight of land, she was hit by a single torpedo from a German U-boat. Moments later, she was rocked by a second, much larger explosion. Almost immediately, the great ship listed sharply towards the wound in her starboard side and began to sink. Less than 20 minutes later, she disappeared beneath the calm, flat sea. The Lusitania was gone and 1,195 men, women, and children had gone with her. The sinking of the Lusitania was perhaps the single most controversial act of the First World War. Almost overnight, it cast England in the role of helpless victim and Germany as the ruthless villain. In the United States, outrage at the loss of American life helped propel this country into the war on Britain's side, even though no one really knew what sank the ship. But there have always been whispers that the Lusitania was not as blameless as she appeared. Some historians have speculated that when the Lusitania left New York, she carried a secret cargo of high explosives, and that when the German torpedo struck, those hidden explosives blew up and sank her. One thing is certain. When the Lusitania steamed into history, she left many unanswered questions in her wake. The truth about what actually happened to the Lusitania on that long ago afternoon in May lies just off the southern coast of Ireland. And in the next two weeks, ocean explorer Bob Ballard, the man who found the Titanic and the Bismarck, will find something just as remarkable at the bottom of the sea. The Lusitania is one of those great unsolved mysteries. 
Well, the mystery is, why did the Lusitania, which was really an auxiliary heavy cruiser, I mean, it was really well built, much better built than the Titanic, uh, had many more compartments. Why did this ship sink so quick? I mean, the Titanic hit an iceberg and was opened up for 300 feet and it took hours to sink. Yet the Lusitania was hit with one torpedo and sank in less than 15 minutes. Uh, why? The seeds of the controversy were planted in the constantly shifting tactics of the First World War. In the spring of 1915, England and Germany were deadlocked on the battlefields in Europe. The British needed supplies, and the only way they could get them was by ship. But a new German weapon, the U-boat, was starting to sink supply ships. The British Admiralty, led by a young Winston Churchill, decided that the most effective countermeasure was to strike first. British merchantmen were instructed to carry concealed weapons and open fire on any U-boat that stopped them. Germany countered with a threat. It declared that any British ship carrying war supplies would be subject to attack without regard for the safety of passengers or crew. Churchill seemed to foresee the consequences of this new escalation. In a letter written three months before the Lusitania was sunk, he stressed the importance of attracting neutral shipping to England. Quote, in the hope especially of embroiling the United States with Germany, for our part, we want the traffic, the more the better. And if some of it gets into trouble, better still. The mystery of what happened to the Lusitania is a complex technical puzzle. This is all one case. All one case. And was Everyone agrees that there were two explosions and that the second was much more powerful than the first. Okay, so, so there's six boxes all together. We know that the first explosion occurred when the torpedo struck. We don't know what caused the second. The documents from the official U.S. inquiry into the tragedy still sit in a New York archive. She did carry 18 fuse cases and 125 shrapnel cases. Although Britain initially denied it, today we know that the Lusitania was carrying military supplies. 303 British U Mark 7, 174 grain bullets. This is what they're admitting to. Winchester repeating arms. But bullets and shrapnel aren't explosive enough to sink a large ship. Since we know that something blew up, the possibility exists that the Lusitania might also have been carrying a more dangerous cargo, like bombs or gun cotton or TNT. 1,248 cases of shrapnel. If so, it would have been stored here in the forward cargo magazine, which is almost precisely where the torpedo struck. The resulting explosion might have sunk the ship, but it would certainly have destroyed the magazine. In either case, the signs of that massive damage should still be lying at the bottom of the sea, waiting for someone to find them. the Irish Channel, 13 miles south of the lighthouse at Old Kinsale. Bob Ballard's research vessel is anchored directly over the spot where the Lusitania sank.
For this investigation, Ballard has assembled the same team and much of the same equipment that helped him find the Titanic and the Bismarck. This time, the location of the sunken ship is known, but not what sank her. I sort of view what we're doing as investigative reporting. We're going out now with a, an extremely advanced technology that has never been available before. And we're going down and uh, something else happened. And what was that something else? Was it because it was carrying war materials, as the Germans claimed? and the torpedo struck a lucky hit and ignited those war materials, vindicating what action the Germans took? Or was it for another set of reasons? And the solution is, where's the hole? How big is it? And what was it caused by? Ballard is not the first person to explore the Lusitania since she sank, just the first to use such sophisticated technology. In the 1960s, an American diver named John Light claimed to have found evidence that the Lusitania was destroyed when her own cargo exploded, and that the British government tried to cover it up. He was obsessed with the idea, and many people believed him. Light made a series of dives that pushed the primitive technology of that time to the limit. With a narrow beam of light to guide his way, he seldom spent more than a few minutes at a time on the wreck and could only glimpse the enormous hull in fragments. But he did find something, what he described as a huge gaping hole in the Lusitania's bow on the port side, directly opposite from where the torpedo struck. The way the explosion is, the way the ship is torn up here, uh, indicates a very, very strong internal explosion. I don't think you could possibly say that uh, it was only from a torpedo striking the ship. The underwater robot called Jason is in the water for the first time. It is about to reveal the Lusitania in a way John Light could only dream of. But shortly before this expedition began, he died at the age of 59. Ballard is hoping to confirm Light's discovery with irrefutable photographic evidence that something in the Lusitania's forward magazine exploded. Okay, there's the side of the ship. We're gonna rise up. To Today, the Lusitania lies in about 300 feet of water on her starboard side, the side where the torpedo struck. Vehicle, please. Ten. ten. Okay. Idea, ten meters west of Jason. There's the top already, Will. It's not far up. Good job, Willie. Are right, you popping pictures, team? There's the beginning of the name. There's the L. It's the U. S. There's the I. The T. A. Travelers intending to embark on the Atlantic voyage are reminded that a state of war exists between Germany and Great Britain, and that travelers sailing in the war zone on ships of Great Britain do so at their own risk. The day the Lusitania was set to sail, this notice appears in the New York newspapers. Believing that the Lusitania is too big and too fast to be threatened by a submarine, 
the Cunard line makes no attempt to alert passengers of the German warning. Nine-year-old Edith Williams was traveling with her mother and five brothers and sisters. No, I don't think she even knew that it was in danger. If she did, she certainly kept it quiet. Now, we never knew anything about it. No. We left New York on the 1st of May, 1915, on the Lusitania. Father, mother, brother, baby, sister, 20 months. And myself, Each time the Lusitania sails from New York, it is a glittering social event. On this voyage, bystanders might have caught a glimpse of millionaire Alfred Vanderbilt or theater impresario Charles Froman, who once introduced a play called Peter Pan to American audiences. I remember the, the, the band playing and people waving flags and at the docks as if it happened yesterday. You know, all this, it's all excitement. You know, this little girl who'd never seen anything like that in her life. And that, it just, it was great, it was beautiful. On a dockside swarming with German spies, the Lusitania's cargo holds are loaded with last minute provisions, including a few hundred cases of bullets and shrapnel shells hidden among barrels of cheese. I can't believe they'd be carrying arms in a passenger ship. Because it was, it was the, well, it was the largest ship then, and it was all wealthy people going back and forwards from Britain to America, you see. They should have been very careful about that sort of thing. But they were not very careful. As far as the German government is concerned, the Lusitania is a legitimate target of war. But for her passengers, that war is still a week and an ocean away. It is still the first day of Ballard's survey. He is looking for the large telltale hole that would confirm a massive explosion in the ship's forward magazine. ghostly image of the bow appears in Jason's cameras, it seems to be intact. Seems like I need to come left. But as Jason moves slowly over the exposed port side, more and more damage becomes apparent. 75 years of winter tides and corrosion have taken their toll. In one place it was definitely bowed out, but it looks like someone took a pair of scissors. Yeah, yeah, I see all that. Yeah, it's a mess. We can see the extent to which it's really been flattened and squashed. Uh, we can tell that instead of being uh, maybe 80 or 90 feet off the seafloor like we could expect, it's only about 30 feet. As the survey continues, Jason's cameras detect some smaller holes, but not near the magazine where the explosives would have been stored. Let's come back to the northwest. I'm turning. Here we go. Control on bridge. At the very bottom of the bow, a large section of the ship is missing, but the damage is well forward of the magazine. So we were much further forward than we yes. thought. But there was no big hole in this neck of the woods. You no, know, but there was a lot of damage in this area. Right, right. A lot of pop rivets, shell yeah. plating just missing. But again, it also could have, damage could have been part of the impact. Okay. It's not what Ballard expected to find. As far as he can tell, the gaping hole reported by John Light simply doesn't exist. 
Ballard thinks he understands the reason for Light's mistake. These are divers. This is a technology of, you know, holding your breath almost and running down there and getting narcissized and getting somewhat narcotic. I mean, you're, you lose your, you know, you're a little drifty down there at 300 feet on compressed air. I mean, they were pushing the limits of diving technology, even using exotic gases. Uh, you're under a lot of stress when you're underwater. And you got a little flashlight, and you're looking around at a little flashlight. No, I don't think uh, they knew where they were exactly. A controversial theory that's been around for decades has suddenly collapsed, and Ballard is no closer to knowing what sank the Lusitania than before. For the moment, at least, Ballard's investigation has reached a dead end. First and foremost, the magazine did not explode. I'm confident of that. I, I went right in, thumped up against the hull. I couldn't have had my hand of the vehicle more than uh, feet from where the magazine is and, uh, and the armament, uh, the munitions. Uh, I would be led to believe that uh, whatever they put in the forward cargo hull didn't explode. It's not what I had hoped. It's not pretty and it makes our investigative reporting that much more difficult. Plus, she's laying on her starboard side. Uh, <laughs> that's the side where the torpedo hit. That's where the answer to the mystery is. Wednesday, May 5th, 1915. A German submarine commanded by Captain Walter Schwieger surfaces in the waters just south of Fastnet Rock. U-boat 20 left Germany the day before the Lusitania sailed and has made her way around the west coast of Ireland. Like the Lusitania, she's also bound for Liverpool. On the surface, she can make 15 knots, underwater about nine. Only the slowest ships would be unable to outrun her. Her crew takes any chance they can to escape the cold, stinking interior of their ship. A thousand miles to the west, the Lusitania's passengers are experiencing the Atlantic somewhat differently. She is 785 feet long and 88 feet wide, midway between bow and stern. She has seven decks towering above the waterline and three more below. She can maintain a speed of 25 knots, but on this trip, the number four boiler room has been shut down to save coal. She is commanded by Captain William Turner, a veteran seaman with 32 years of service with the Cunard Line. Her four dining rooms can serve over 10,000 meals a day, and her first-class kitchen rivals the best in Europe. She has a library and a doctor's office smoking salons, a music room. She even has elevators and a two-story first-class dining room capped by an elegant dome. A floating palace, someone called her. But for nine-year-old Edith Williams, the Lusitania is a floating playground. I walked a lot. On board on ship, I was I was in a new world. I really can you imagine being now and, and all this glamorous stuff. Alice Lines was 18 years old, a nurse in charge of a three-month-old baby named Audrey. It was just a gorgeous ship. It's like traveling in a hotel. We had dances and lovely meals. But there was no talk of war at all with anybody. 
Only thing I remember fairly clear every morning, uh, Dad got me up early and we walked all around the Lusitania. It was good and we had a very calm voyage, no sea symptoms. One thing I remember about the Lusitania was there I had my first drink of cold refrigerated milk. Every day was a, a dream. It was something, how beautiful, because we lived, you know, very poorly. We were poor, hungry. And to find something like this, it was, can you one explain it, really? Wednesday, May 5th, evening. In the past 24 hours, the U-20 has sunk one ship, a schooner carrying some bacon, but she needed deck cannon and grenades to do it. The one time she attempted to fire a torpedo on this mission, it got jammed in the tube. Now she will have a second chance. At 8.30 that evening, Captain Schwieger spots a steamer through the fog. The U-20 fires one torpedo at point-blank range. This time, it clears the tube, but doesn't explode. The submarine's activity is reported to the Admiralty Office in London, but no one quite knows what countermeasures to take, except watch and wait. 24 hours later, Thursday, May 6th, the Lusitania stands poised to enter British coastal waters and the war zone. The lifeboats have been swung away from the ship in the unlikely event they will be needed. After briefly attending a cocktail party with Charles Froman and Alfred Vanderbilt, Captain Turner returns to the bridge to find a telegram waiting for him. Submarines active off south coast of Ireland. Minutes later, another message arrives. Avoid headlands, pass harbors at full speed, steer mid-channel course submarines off fast net. Captain Turner orders the curtains drawn in all staterooms and passes the word that gentlemen wishing to smoke an after-dinner cigar should not do so on deck. The night before we were torpedoed, the, the steward came into our, my room and drew all the curtains. And I said, what's this all for? And he said, well, that's my orders. That night after dinner, the Welsh choir gives a concert. A fight erupts among a group of men playing cards in the first class smoking room. And Edith Williams takes a stroll with her mother. On the deck one time, she said to me, she did say this, and I remember it, that if we're to be drowned, let us hope that we'll all be drowned, or all saved, something to that, probably in prayer, she said it. That's all I remember about my mother. And below decks, the endless movement of wheelbarrows from the coal bunkers continues until they are empty of nearly everything but dust. A few hundred miles away, Captain Schwieger congratulates his crew for the two cargo ships they have sunk that day and plays a record by Wagner on the ship's gramophone. Then he makes a decision that will change history. Instead of continuing on to Liverpool, he will cruise the Irish Channel with his remaining three torpedoes. Although Ballard's investigation is at an impasse, he is not yet prepared to admit failure. He knows that something must have caused the second explosion that sank the Lusitania. 
But if her cargo didn't blow up, what did? Ballard decides to have a look for himself in the two-man submarine called Delta. One approach to the wreck is along the line that the Lusitania herself followed as she sank. trail of coal marks the way. Coal. The Lusitania carried 5,000 tons of it in a series of massive bunkers arranged along both sides of the ship. And those bunkers lie directly behind the undamaged magazine. It's only the smallest clue, but it means that as the Lusitania sank, the coal bunkers on her starboard side must have been open to the sea. Friday, May 7th, 1915, shortly before one o'clock. After a morning of slow progress through heavy fog, the Lusitania rounds the southwest tip of Ireland. She is finally in sight of land. I was six years old, and we were standing on the coast of Southern Ireland off the old Hedekin Sail on a lovely sunny afternoon, enjoying the scenery, and we saw this liner coming around the corner. I'd never seen such a big liner as this in my life before. And uh, we were fascinated watching it coming towards us virtually. Wonderful sight. It was a fine day. Yes, it was a fine day. And that morning, Dad, when we come from breakfast, Dad said, look out there. And he said, can, what can you see? That was the Irish coast we was on. About 15 miles away, U-Boat 20 is running on the surface when a lookout spots four funnels on the horizon. Though he has no hope of catching this unidentified liner, Captain Schwieger gives the order to submerge. At almost the same moment on the bridge of the Lusitania, Captain Turner orders a turn to starboard toward Liverpool and puts his ship directly in the path of the onrushing submarine. Captain Schwieger cannot believe his luck. It is just after two o'clock. In the Lusitania's dining room, second lunch is being served. The Lusitania is 1,000 meters away from the U-boat and closing fast. At 700 meters, Captain Schwieger gives the order to fire one torpedo. We were at lunch, and this girl who shared the cabin with me, she thought we should be starting to pack. So, of course, I left the table and went with her to the cabin. And we were just inside when there was this noise. Oh, it was a terrific explosion. A terrific one. And it sounds as if it was right near to. It frightened the life out of me. The torpedo strikes the ship just behind the bridge. A spout of water, steam, and black dust erupt somewhere behind the forward crow's nest. Of people pushing, shoving to get as high as they could, getting near the back. Almost immediately, the ship lists sharply to starboard. The lifeboats on that side swing away from the ship. On the port side, the lifeboats swing in. Lowering them becomes almost impossible. 
the lifeboats went up and down and they were out of order because they couldn't run, they were all crooked. So they had just to fill the boat and lowered it down by hand and then when they got to the water they cut the rope and of course the first two overturned and the people were thrown in the water. We'd come to an open space, got me hands in prayer and I said, please God save us, please God save us. In the mounting panic, nursemaid Alice Lines wraps three-month-old Audrey into a shawl and ties it around her neck. Then she heads for the lifeboat with Audrey's older brother in tow. I followed best I could to get into the, into the lifeboat. And a, an officer came and grabbed me and he said, you can't go in there, it's full. And I said, I must, my boy is in there. And I've just put my boy there, I must. And I got myself free from him and they were lowering the lifeboat and I jumped. Trying to escape the onrushing seas, other passengers climbed to the highest points on the ship. I had my sister Florence with me, but we got to the poop deck next to the funnels. And so we were, went down with a sink, and when she got to where we were on the top, we just went into the ocean. My life belt slipped off, and I was holding on to Florence, but I couldn't hold on any longer. I had to let her go. That was very traumatic. That lasted this hand. It was this hand. Lasted till I was 19 or 20 years old. I could still, that's extraordinary. I still could feel the grip. And very gradually, the bows went down. And as the bows went down, the stern came up until the propellers were out of the water. She was quite clear of the water. And at an angle, I would think, of about 45 degrees, she sat poised. And then, as if just on the slide, she slowly slid down, quite, quite dramatically, below the waves. The sea was boiling, and um, the liner disappeared. feet below the surface, the great ship came to rest. Inside her were those who had never even made it to the decks. When the power failed and plunged the ship into darkness, they were trapped in the boiler rooms, the cargo holds, the second-class cabins, the first-class elevators. door still stands open, a last desperate effort to escape as the ship went down. Off to one side, part of a woman's shoe. Three hundred feet above the liner, death is assuming a different form scattered in a great swath that runs for a mile. Those who survive the sinking itself are beginning to die from exposure in the frigid sea. When I came up, there was nothing in sight at all. The boat was disappeared, and all I could see was heads bobbing up and down, and chairs, tables, and things like that, and people calling out. And these two men were on a, a lifeboat upside down, two of them, and they dragged me on with them. I know I was in the water and crying and uh, being picked up. Just think there were only seven lifeboats, but they grabbed me. And uh, it was Mr. Hook that pulled me out. 
Dad. He pulled her by the hair and got her into the boat. I didn't see the Lusitanian here go down, but I seen this row of people moaning, and it was like a half a circle of people moaning in the water. It was just a moan, a constant moan, and it gradually got less and less. Over a week has passed since Ballard started his investigation, and he's beginning to focus on an idea suggested by retired Captain Cyril Spur, a British munitions expert who's just joined his team. Spur has pointed out that if the torpedo had struck at any point behind the forward magazine, it would have hit a coal bunker. Since the ship was at the end of her crossing, the bunkers would have been almost empty except for a thick layer of coal dust on the floor. How many of those bunkers would have to be violated for the ship to sink the way it did? The Lusitania was built so as to float with two compartments open to the sea, and with more compartments open, she could not stay afloat. What is the explosive nature of coal dust? Is there a gas buildup in these things? Is there... With a, a disruption, there could be a serious cloud of coal dust, which would be very explosive indeed. We heard a sharp explosion initially, yes. which would have been the torpedo, yes. and a rumbling. That, coal, that, would, that, match, that would match a dust explosion more accurately. Right. you still have the classic ingredients for an explosion, provided that you've got a source of ignition. Must have a source of ignition. So you have the torpedo coming in and hitting right about there, somewhere in that neck of the woods, just below the water line in the red. And you would have had a, an initial explosion, a sharp explosion, which everyone reported. And that would have blown out plating. And then that explosion, that fireball that it ignited, then ignited what I think was the coal dust. It shook, shook the bunker, got the coal up in the air, the remaining dust, and then ignited that. And so now the sea is going to pour into that area. And the ship is going to immediately list to starboard, dumping coal on the floor of the ocean as it goes from the ruptured uh, bunkers and then crack on the bottom and the forces of gravity would have slowly caused it to settle to where it's now sort of a sealed tomb. Although we may never know the whole truth, it now seems likely that the sinking of the Lusitania was simply one of those strange quirks of fate that happen in war. I don't think anyone expected one torpedo to sink it. I, I don't think the German skipper that fired it thought he was really gonna sink it. And I don't think the captain thought once he'd been hit that he was gonna sink. It was just bad luck. Otherwise, you're not going to see a thing. The Cunard Archive in Liverpool. Just make your way down, and they're on the left hand side, on the bottom. Today, the Cunard line records of the Lusitania disaster fill only a few shelves. In the haste to find answers and assign blame, the human stories have been largely forgotten. May 7th, 1915, evening. 
the first victims of the sinking arrive in the Irish port of Queenstown. By the following morning, the Lusitania has made headlines everywhere around the globe. In Liverpool and New York, anxious relatives and friends gather for word of their loved ones. The sea has been remarkably democratic in who it claimed. lost a little sister, 20 months old. I suppose she was drowned as soon as she entered the water, I expect. There wasn't much chance of a little girl like that, was it? Gradually, the dimensions of the disaster become apparent. Of the 1,959 people aboard the ship, there are only 764 survivors. The Cunard Line offers a cash reward for the bodies that have started to float ashore as far away as Wales. Only 289 are recovered. Of these, 65 are never identified. There were just rows and rows of people who had been taken out of the sea who were dead. I went over quite a number, and then I saw my father's body, and the that was that. I didn't do any more after that. When we arrived in Queenstown, and they told me I cried for my mother all night, wondered where she was, and she was a little girl. Naturally would want to know where her mother was. So they said, oh, she's probably perhaps in another hotel, etc. So, But she was never found, like a thousand other people. Sir, the following message is copying ink pen on brown paper enclosed in a bottle was picked up near Waterford on the 18th and delivered to me today. Quote, no other papers to be got. Going down with Lusitania, torpedoed off old head Kinsale. M. McManus, goodbye. In the weeks to come, Great Britain will deny that the Lusitania was carrying arms and set up an official inquiry, which will promptly blame Germany for the disaster. Winston Churchill would talk of resigning, but end up leading his nation to victory in another war against Germany 30 years later. The German people will welcome the crew of U-Boat 20 like heroes when they return home. And in the United States, there will be an immediate outcry for a declaration of war against Germany but nearly two years will pass before that happens. When you have a disaster like this where so many truly innocent people, I mean, they were innocent children, women, people from neutral countries, had absolutely nothing to do with the war, died. You always want to say, well, who's to blame? Who do we pin this on? And from what I can see, everyone was to blame. It was not a good performance on the part of the human race. No, I don't think about nothing more about it. It's one of those things and you can't do nothing about it. Can we? It was 
a bad day for we, but I think we was very fortunate in saving four lives out of five. And we didn't talk about it. Even with Dad, we didn't talk to Dad about it. Did you talk to Dad about it? No. No? We said I had the house. Yes, so do I. Oh, yes, this is my baby. <laughs> oh, that's right. 79 years have passed since Alice Lyons wrapped three-month-old baby Audrey in her shawl and jumped for a lifeboat. She's a very dear, close friend, and it means a great deal to me because she saved my life. You did cry a lot. That's no doubt about it. Said you were a cry baby. Yes, you did tell me that, I must yes. say. But as a six-year-old boy, it was something that would stick in my mind, as it has done, for the rest of my life. And although time fades and the little gray cells get worn out, I can still sit here now and see that liner just sliding beneath the wave. Oh, I think that uh, it still could have a lot of war materials aboard that are undocumented. Uh, I think it becomes more and more a footnote, though, as we show that it wasn't the explosion of those war materials that put it to the bottom. I'm content with what we found out, and now it's, it's time to move on to another piece of history. The last voyage of the Lusitania took the talents of 200 people and nearly three years to create. The film crew, led by producer and cinematographer Peter Schnall, traveled nearly 100,000 miles and shot in 24 locations, including this one just off the coast of Ireland. The crew is here to cover an expedition that's loaded with underwater cameras and high-tech wonders. We got more toys out here, more cameras, subsea, underwater, on top of water than you could possibly imagine. And that's the fun part. I mean, basically what you're looking at here is a floating city. Welcome to the Northern Horizon, home to 50 sailors, scientists, and historians. They'll spend the next two weeks probing every foot of the wreck, looking for evidence that would finally close the door on the last voyage of the Lusitania. As the action and moments of discovery unfold, the film crew will work around the clock to cover it all. Today, the crew will focus on the expedition star, the camera-laden robot named Jason. As the sub approaches the bow of the ship, Ballard spots a dangerous curtain of nets. Toward the stern, you'd rather do it back there. There's a net right there. Float off your left. But the warning comes too late. Jason hits the net and veers out of control. The half million dollar underwater eye is trapped and the expedition is in jeopardy. So now what we have to do is follow the story as it unravels. And of course that's one of the greatest things about cinema verite, about making a documentary, is that you are there to follow the moment. 
The moment grows tense as two divers prepare to descend and cut Jason free. You watch Bob's face as they send the divers overboard and just see how they are going to deal with the situation. And at the same time, we have to be very careful not to get in the way of what's going on because it is a dangerous situation. After 40 anxious minutes, Jason is released and the moment is captured on film. But like many scenes that were shot, this one never makes it into the movie. In the end, the rescue is overshadowed by Ballard's new evidence and theory of how the Lusitania exploded and sank. But filming at sea wasn't Peter's only challenge. He also had to bring the past to life. Here at the Los Angeles Maritime Museum, he's about to perform a little movie magic. By filming a 17-foot model of the liner with a telescopic lens, Peter is able to transport the audience onto the deck of the Lusitania. It is a big challenge to try to bring a historical subject to life. So we're, we're kind of creating reality a little bit. But at least it, it allows the audience to maybe just for a moment get a sense of what that ship might have looked like. There's nothing like talking to people who actually walk these decks, but getting them to remember what happened 80 years ago was perhaps Peter's greatest challenge. Sometimes that one-on-one -on -one situation can be more difficult than directing 50 people in the middle of the Irish Sea. And it was kind of funny and frustrating all at the same time. I think I'll start with a kind of a simple question. Do you remember no. anything from the... No, I d can't remember anything. Nothing? Not anything. Did you ever talk to your brother about? Yes. Did he ever tell you anything? He, he could remember a few things. Do you remember what he told you? No, not Neil. Did you ever talk to your mother or your father about yes. it? Yes. Did they ever tell you anything? They always, they could tell me, well, everything I knew, they told me, you see. Do you remember what they told you? No, not Neil, I don't think I can. But the more we talked to him, and the more we got him to think about it, it seemed like suddenly he did remember. And that, to me, was absolutely amazing. It was a bad day for we, but I think we was very fortunate in saving four lives out of five. When the film was finished, the edit team had reduced 280 hours of footage into a one-hour story. We began researching this film years before we shot one frame of film. We never knew what Bob was going to discover under sea. We never knew what the survivors were going to tell us. And that's the greatest thing about making movies, is that you never know what's going to happen. And yet, when it happens, and things work out great, there's nothing else like it.
We hope you have enjoyed this presentation from the National Geographic Video Library. I've walked many battlefields on land. The guns are gone, the tanks are gone. But here, the ships are still locked in combat. Travel to the South Pacific with explorer Robert Ballard. Your mission, join with the National Geographic Society and the United States Navy to reassemble the fractured pieces of the past. 50 years ago, the World War came to Guadalcanal. Six months of explosive seafaring battles that shook the world and the lives of the men who lived to talk about it. Better oil shells up to the stern of our ship. We could see them coming. They were just like red lanterns coming right straight at us. It seemed to me like it's coming right straight at me. Now, through the words of the men who fought there and through the lens of Robert Ballard's camera, sail with the lost fleet of Guadalcanal. as we do. They pay tribute to the fallen. They will risk the entire herd to protect one of their own. Do we share more with these great creatures than we realized? Follow the last free-roaming African elephants in Reflections on Elephants, a new National Geographic special. <laughs>